Hello, my name is Nuno Carvalho, and today I'll be going through my answers to the 2021 AP Physics C Electricity and Magnetism uh, FRQs. This was released the day that I'm recording this, May 5th, uh, and this was the actual FRQs that were given out uh, two days ago during the first administration on May 3rd. And since I'm a student of AP Physics C Electricity and Magnetism, I took this exam myself. So I'll be going through, uh, well, what the answers should be, I would hope. Uh, unfortunately, like unlike my previous videos where they actually give out the scoring guidelines uh, for the multiple choice, they haven't released those yet for these FRQs. And so I'll be taking my best guess at what these answers are. And hopefully by showing you my reasoning and my logic, uh, hopefully they make sense. I, to me, they make sense. Uh, and But if you think that I'm wrong, if you think that some of my answers are maybe uh, incorrect or my explanation wasn't really that good, please let me know in the comments and I'll try to leave some sort of correction in the description. Uh, but yeah, please enjoy the video. FRQ number two is your classic lab experiment FRQ uh, that has become a mainstay of the AP Physics C FRQ, um, I guess, structure for over the past decade or so. Uh, but so let's read here what it says. Students perform an experiment to study the force between two charged objects using the apparatus shown above, which contains two identical conducting spheres. The upper sphere is attached to an insulating string, which can be used to move the sphere downward. The lower sphere sits on an insulating rod, which is on an electronic balance. The electronic balance is zeroed before the lower sphere and insulating rod are in place. For the first trial, a charge Q is placed on each sphere and the upper sphere is slowly moved downward. The students measure the distance D between the centers of the sphere and the magnitude F of the force that appears on the electronic balance. The recorded data are shown on the graph F as a function of 1 over D squared shown below. And here's the data. Part one of part A is our freebie point here. It's telling us to draw a line that best represents uh, the best fit to the points shown. And this should be pretty easy. Just draw a line that uh, is passing through the points. And it's also should be uh, relatively even in the sense that there will be an equal amount of points above and below, like so. Part two of part A is now asking us to use the graph to calculate the charge Q. And what we need to be using here is our line of best fit here. We need to use a slope on that. Uh, but how are we going to even use it? Well, we need to come up with a formula that relates uh, F of 1 over D squared and Q. Okay, so we need to come up with something that connects these two. And so luckily for us, from our formula sheet, we should be able to see that F of E is going to equal to K times Q1 times Q2 over D squared. Okay, and in this scenario here, Q1 and Q2 are the same, which is to say that they're just Q squared, okay? And now you can see F, you can see 1 over D squared here, and you can see Q as well. Uh, so now we need to rearrange this, and so what I would do is I would have something that will look a little bit weird, okay? Uh, I'm doing the force over 1 over D squared, which is to say that's the same thing as saying force times D squared. But the reason I'm putting it like that is to make it more clear that this is going to be the slope of our line right here. And so this is going to equal to kq squared, like so. But so notice here that this is the slope of our line here, because the units are force, or it's we're talking about force over 1 over d squared. So I can rearrange this to say that this is just equal to the slope. And now, how do we calculate the slope? Well, we need to calculate rise over run. So change in y over change in x, or if you want to be uh, more clear here with the question you do something like this and you want to pick any two points here that are easy to read uh, the ones that I chose was this one here and I believe this one so I'd be doing uh, one twelve thousand five hundred minus uh, nine thousand seven hundred and fifty and keep in mind this is in micro uh, newtons so I'm doing to the negative six and then over, and I'm doing the change in x, which is going to be 85 minus 20. And then what I end up getting here is that the slope is equal to uh, 4.23 times 10 to negative 5. But we actually don't really care too much about this number, not yet. We're just going to use it at the end here. Uh, what I'd be doing here now is that we want to relate this and this and solve for q. So what we'd have is that if kq squared is equal to slope, then that tells me that q itself is going to equal to the square root of slope over k, where k is 9 to the times 10 to the negative 9. And so when I plug all this in and 
uh, usually you want to plug this you want to show that you're plugging this in because you could get points from it uh, when you do that and so I'd be doing something like this and what I get as my final answer and it's okay if your answer wasn't exactly the same um, as long as it's sort of around there of course there's going to be some variability given the uh, the slope that you the points that you use to calculate the slope from your line of best fit but the answer should be sort of around this uh, this number here Part three of part A is a quick one. We're told on the graph on the previous page, draw a circle around the data point that was taken when the distance between the centers of the spheres was the least. Uh, so looking here, and let me erase the previous circles that I drew. We have here uh, one over D squared as our X axis, okay? Which is to say one over D squared means that as we decrease the distance, Right? As we decrease the distance, we're actually going to be increasing 1 over d squared because it's in the denominator right here. So the point that's furthest to the right will have the shortest distance, uh, but it will also have the biggest 1 over d squared uh, value. But so that's to say that this point right here should be circled. Part 4 of part A, we're now asked to determine the distance between the centers of the sphere for the data point indicated above. Well, we indicated this data point here, and it seems to have a value of 1 over d squared of around like 82.5, I'd say. So we would say 82.5 meters is equal to 1 over d squared. Really, we don't need the units until the end. Let's just remember that it's in meters, uh, which is to say that d is going to be the square root of 1 over 82.5. And so let me grab your, my calculator, putting this in my calculator and plugging in. I'm going to get that the distance was around 0.11 meters. And so that would be our answer. Finally, part five of part A is asking us what physical quantity does the vertical intercept represent? And for us to justify our answer, well, let's look at it this again. The vertical intercept is going to be, well, the same thing as the y intercept. And it seems to happen at around 9,000 micronewtons or so. And what this means is that 1 over d squared is going to equal 0. And in the context of our problem, that must mean that the distance is sort of like going off towards infinity, OK? Uh, maybe let me, not, let, let me not write 1 over infinity. That's kind of bad form. But it tells us that d is going towards infinity, which means the, uh, the two balls here, the two spheres, are going to be infinitely far away. And so basically, they're not exerting any electrical force on each other. So then, how is it that the electronic scale is still going to be measuring a force of 9,000 micronewtons? Well, this is where you need to remember maybe a little bit of your mechanics um, in that, well, gravity still exists. That's something we kind of tend to forget when we do EMAG. But gravity does still exist here. And so the answer here would be gravity. Uh, it would be the gravitational force on the sphere. Uh, that is pushing down on the electronic balance uh, and those, so that's the reading that it gets but it doesn't have any electric force because the spheres are going to be infinitely far away and for my justification for this answer i would basically just say what i just said finally we're at part b and we're told that the experiment is extended by collecting additional data points and so those are those data points that are going to the right of this uh, line here uh, which appears on the right side of the graph shown above the new data points do not follow the linear pattern seen with the first points the group of students tries to explain this discrepancy. So one student suspects that the charge is slowly leaking off the top sphere. Could this explain the discrepancy? So let's think about it. What seems to be happening here is that for this first half, you know, we have this line here that, that's, that has a some slope here. And then after this point, the line of best fit seems to definitely decrease in slope, okay? So it seems like the slope is decreasing. If we remember from one of our earlier answers, we said that the slope, which is going to be f of e over 1 over d squared, was going to be equal to uh, kq squared, OK? Uh, let's now actually split this up into k q1 and q2, like this, uh, because it seems like just one of the spheres is losing charge. And let's think about it. If q1 here, let's just say q1 is the top charge or the top sphere, uh, if that was losing charge, that would cause the slope to also go down which would make sense. It would explain here the the sort of sloping down here of the, or the curving down of the slope that seems to happen with the later data points. So I would say yes, and I would justify my answer by just sort of explaining in words uh, this, this uh, formula here that I just derived. Part C tells us that a second student suspects that the excess charges have rearranged themselves, polarizing the spheres. 
and were asked on the circles representing the spheres below to use a single plus sign on each sphere to represent the locations of highest concentration of the excess positive charges. So what this is basically saying is that maybe the students originally thought that the spheres had the positive charges like equally surrounding here the, the surface, but then the excess charges rearrange themselves and they polarize the spheres, meaning that uh, they're going to basically create a dipole within each sphere. And if you remember a dipole, that was a positive charge and a negative charge. So what I'd be thinking is that the positive charges are going to be repelling from each other and they're going to be on one end of the spheres. And so again, since the like charges repel, I'd expect there to be a net positive charge on the top half of this top sphere and a net positive charge uh, building on the bottom side of the bottom sphere like so. And uh, that would be, that would represent what the student here is describing. For part two of part C, we're now asked to explain how this arrangement uh, that we described in part one could be responsible for the discrepancy, okay? And so again, to explain the discrepancy, it has to do something with the slope or with the data in the graph. And so I'll take you back to this formula here, which is, well, a very important formula, all things considered for ENM, like so. But this really is sort of describing what are we measuring in our graph, okay? And what is really happening when this discrepancy here of polarizing the spheres occurs? Well, the distance between the two spheres, which maybe before was this distance, or maybe even the distance between the centers, it's not explicitly stated how they did that. Uh, that was the old distance, but with this new polarization, actually the distance between the charges, which is what we care about when we're measuring about the electric force, is going to be increasing, okay? And so that means that we'd be increasing uh, that distance, which means we'd be decreasing the force for every uh, for all of these data points, okay? So while before we were measuring the distance um, of these, we were measuring the distance between the spheres and we were thinking that that's the accurate distance for this formula here, once the uh, spheres become polarized, the actual distance, the real distance that is determining the amount of force is actually going to increase, which means that we'd be decreasing the amount of force that'd be felt. And so this explains why before we'd expect sort of a line to continue in this way, but by increasing the distance, we're sort of dampening here the force because in reality, the force is less than we'd be expecting. And that would explain why the slope decreases like so. So that's how that's how the student, um, how, that's how the student's explanation makes sense. A third student is now suggesting that the experiment can be modified so that the top sphere is given a negative charge that is equal in magnitude to the positive charge given to the bottom sphere. So we're asked on the circles representing the spheres below, use a single plus sign on the bottom sphere to represent the location of highest concentration of the excess positive charges and use a single negative sign on the top sphere to represent the location of highest concentration of excess negative charges. So similarly to how before we were saying that the positive charges repelled each other, like charges are going to attract one another. And so we'd expect something to look like this with the negative charge closer to the bottom, because keep in mind, we have conducting spheres, so charges are free to move around. Um, but so yeah, that would represent our two spheres now. For part two, we're asked for a separation distance equal to that of the data point uh, indicated in part A, part three, would the magnitude of the force reading with the spheres of opposite charges be greater than, less than, or equal to in magnitude of the force reading with the spheres of the same charges? So now we're comparing two different setups here. Okay, so let's have here the electronic balance. Uh, and in the original, we had a plus and a plus over here. But now in this new one, we have a plus and a minus, okay? And so how's that going to change the reading on the electric balance? Well, before, since like charges repelled, uh, we'd have a electric force that would be pointing down, like so, okay? And so the measurement that we'd be reading from our electronic scale or electronic balance would be from that and also uh, from the gravitational force as well, I should mention. That's going to be felt on both here. But with a negative charge, well, like charges or opposite charges attract one another, right? And so the force would be felt upwards, okay? And so the net force here of of this new setup would definitely be decreasing, right? Uh, maybe I'm drawing here the, the line with a little bit too much magnitude uh, because I'd imagine there'd still be a reading or else the the sphere would be floating and be accelerating upwards. But either way, it's clear to see that the net force, which is downward, right? So this is a downward net force is going to be decreasing because there's now a electric force instead of it pointing downwards it's going to be pointing upwards so here we'd say for sure less than let's say the magnitude is less than and for my justification my answer i would basically just explain what i said